Good evening and welcome to the June edition of Third Thursday at Hoover's. And it's great to see so many returning visitors tonight. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. It's a great evening to get out of the heat. And boy, it's been warm over here in Eastern Iowa. And, uh, Professor Kuhn will tell us it's even hotter in uh, Ames. But, uh, and it's great to pick up some interesting Hoover history in the comfort of an air-conditioned room. At least we hope you're in one tonight. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. I'd like to encourage you to regularly check our website and Facebook page, as well as those of the library, historic site, and your favorite public library for special program offerings that'll pop up in the months ahead. In fact, we have online programs every month for you to enjoy the rest of 2021. Next month, we'll host the return of a favorite speaker of ours from Oxford, Dr. Elizabeth Cox, who will discuss post-World War I food relief in Europe. Stay tuned for more details on that one as they develop. And that program will be on July 15th at 6 p.m. But for tonight, as for this program, we invite you to enter questions at any time during the program through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd also like to hear those answered. As we might not have time to answer all the questions provided, top vote getters will get asked first. Today's presentation is called Clearing the Static, Herbert Hoover and Early Radio Regulation. We're fortunate to have Professor Steve Kuhn presenting tonight. Steve is a retired university professor, international communications consultant, and former coordinator of electronic media studies in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Iowa State University. Now, Professor Kuhn has presented communication workshops in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Workshop topics include new media, social media, writing and reporting for radio and television, civic journalism, election and political reporting, journalism ethics and professional responsibilities, and investigative reporting. Steve, it's always a pleasure to welcome you to these programs, and we're really eager to hear tonight's presentation. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you, first of all, for giving me this opportunity. And also, I want to thank uh, several people who have made this possible. Now, I do have to say that uh, you, in your introduction, have made me sound more important than I am. But I will uh, take that uh, as a nice introduction, nevertheless. I'm going to uh, spend several minutes uh, talking about a variety of issues. I'm going to divide this program into four segments. And what I want to do is to spend several minutes talking about each one of those segments. And then I want to have enough time to answer any questions that any of you have about the presentation or ask anything about contemporary communication, because what I want to do is to talk about what Herbert Hoover did as Secretary of Commerce from 1921 to 1927 and what role he played working with others to set the agenda and to help develop the regulation for broadcasting radio, much of which actually prevails today. And so I think if we can take a look at the first slide, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is called Clearing the Static, Herbert Hoover and Early Radio Regulation. And if we'll go to the next slide, I want to invite anyone who has a question that you may not ask or I didn't have a chance to answer during tonight's presentation, feel free to send your question or comments, any observation to me at my email address, skuhn42 at gmail.com. Now on the next slide, as I said, I want to divide this into four segments. The first one will be early developments of radio. This will be a history of some of the innovations that led to radio. And then the second segment, I will be talking about Herbert Hoover and regulation. 
I'll move on to the third segment, which we'll discuss a little bit about later regulation, and it'll be based pretty much on the legacy that Herbert Hoover and his collaborators established when they were forming the Radio Act of 1927, what remains in terms of later regulation. And now I want to talk in the fourth segment, I'm going to talk about today. And by today, I mean some of the communication issues that we are concerned about. And when I say concerned about, I mean professional communicators, I mean politicians, policymakers, as well as you and me, the public, consumers and users of contemporary communication platforms. The next slide, here we have four of the historical giants that helped in the innovation of radio. On the far left, we have the Italian inventor and entrepreneur, Guglielmo Marconi. That's a familiar name to anyone who has studied radio. He uh, was uh, an Italian, but the Italian government didn't take much interest in his experiments with early telephony on his family's estate. So he and his mother moved to England and England was much more receptive to some of his ideas. And he later established a company and did several of his extremely successful and important experiments there in the United Kingdom. To the right, we have Reginald uh, Fessenden and uh, he had a number of important contributions, uh, one of which is that he actually broadcast the first voice and music on Christmas Eve in 1906. So that was a dramatic innovation and development and to the right, we have uh, Lee DeForest. And Lee DeForest's contribution was that he developed what was called the Audion. And that simply was a mechanism for pushing broadcast waves much farther, expanding the coverage of radio waves. And then finally on the right, we have Edwin Armstrong. And uh, he was a professor at Columbia University probably, I think, for our purposes, uh, best known as the father of FM radio. So the next slide, history of early regulation. Well, as it turns out, there really wasn't anything to help uh, govern the early developments of a wireless telephony, that is telegraph that was being sent uh, without wires. Uh, the first uh, real significant piece of legislation was the so-called Wireless Ship Act of 1910. And that required that all ships, all ocean-going vessels with uh, more than 60 passengers had to have wireless apparatus, wireless equipment on board. The Radio Act of 1912, however, is the one that really set the stage for broadcast regulation in the United States. And that was a direct result of the sinking of the Titanic, which is pictured here on this slide, the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, in which 1,500 people died. There were, as a result of that legislation, a requirement that all ships from that moment on, from 1912 on, had to have 24 hour operation by radio operators. Now there were two radio operators on board the Titanic at the time that it sank. What happened was one of them was asleep and the other one was busy sending telegraph messages, personal messages from passengers. And so he was unable to receive distress signals and warnings that came from other vessels. Had he been able to uh, receive those perhaps he and the Titanic might have avoided the catastrophe that occurred. The next slide, uh, just very quickly, I'm going to show some pictures of some early users of um, 
radio and you can see they're wearing their headsets and they're listening to radio. And this was starting to really develop very rapidly. I have listed the Department of Commerce because as a result of the uh, 1910 SHIP Act, it, the Wireless Radio Act of 1910, it gave jurisdiction over radio to the Department of Commerce. And so that's why the Department of Commerce played uh, an important role at the beginning of the 1920s in terms of radio regulation. The next slide. These are just uh, more photographs of uh, early radio operators. You can see a young man on the left and he is obviously enjoying radio as, uh, as a hobbyist. And on the right, you see a Navy sailor and uh, there was serious consideration at one time that the Navy, when using radio during World War I, might actually keep that jurisdiction under its control. As we'll discuss a little bit later, that didn't happen and there were some good reasons for doing that. The next slide. Again, just a couple of more photographs to just show the variety of people who were interested in radio and operating their own equipment. Next slide. Going to talk a little bit about the, the development now of radio and who was involved in that. And if we'll move on to the next slide, what I want to emphasize is that a lot of the early development took place by experimenters on university and college campuses. This is perhaps one of my favorite radio stations since I uh, am retired from Iowa State University and still live in Ames. 9YI was the, were the call letters for WOI radio. And it is uh, considered one of the first radio stations in America. Now I have to quickly say that because the um, Hoover Presidential Foundation is very close to the University of Iowa. And I probably should say that the University of Iowa also claims that its early experiments, really the same year, about 1911, that it is one of the first radio stations in America. I will let those two schools and historians battle that out on their own. But in any event, uh, this is one of the early radio stations, WOI. Next slide. And uh, these are some folks who are listening and you can see the size of the radio receivers and uh, increasing popularity in terms of programs. The next slide. The, uh, this is a slide of uh, one of the first radio broadcasts and it was a broadcast of an opera, two operas. And you have uh, the uh, famous baritone Enrico Caruso on the right and uh, Betty Beston on the left. Uh, she, both of them were performing the Cavalleria Rusticata and Pagliacci. Mm -hmm. And that was broadcast live. And uh, so that was one of the first examples of early radio programming that really attracted a lot of people. Uh, I'm sorry, someone did correct me. Thank you. Yes, Caruso was a tenor, not a baritone. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next slide. I want to talk about uh, one of the reasons why <laughs> Herbert Hoover was so successful in establishing the uh, protocols and the mechanisms for the successful regulation of early radio. He was very much interested in standardization. One of the responsibilities of the Commerce Department in the uh, 1920s was standardization and the oversight of various products. Interestingly enough, when Herbert Hoover came into office, he discovered that there were no standard sizes for items such as 
the size of bricks, the dimensions of lumber, the size of milk bottles, or the size of radio tires. And so working with others, he and his uh, partners decided and successfully negotiated standards so that it made it possible for companies to actually stock supplies of these products as opposed to ordering specific sizes of those products individually. And that was uh, one example of standardization. I think if we go on to the next slide, we will see that We'll go on to the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about Herbert Hoover's view of radio. This is part two. He recognized early on the importance of the spoken word, and he uh, realized that there was going to be some kind of need to control radio, because as I said at the very outset of this presentation, there were too many stations coming on the air and they were interfering with each other because there were no rules in play to tell everyone, okay, these are the rules, these are the standards, here are the regulations. Those didn't exist. And so he was very much interested because he saw the potential of a radio and needed some kind of government control. But he also recognized, and he referred to radio as an art. And so the challenge was, how do we do these things? How do we control and bring some kind of order to the chaos of this new art, radio? Next slide. In his opening remarks to the first of four radio conferences that he uh, held between 1922 and 1924, he emphasized the uh, following things. He noted the astonishing development of the wireless telephony, and I'm simply referring to that in this presentation as radio. And he also noted that the Commerce Department was responsible for regulating the radio industry, and how exactly was the department going to do that. And he was interested, and his collaborators were interested in proposing legislation to Congress, because Herbert Hoover recognized that it wouldn't be and shouldn't be just one person alone. There should be some specific legislation that gave the Department of Commerce some power over the radio industry. The next slide. I'm going to take just a few seconds to actually read the quotations that he made at the beginning of the radio conferences. He noted, we are indeed today upon the threshold of a new means of widespread communication of intelligence that has had the most profound importance from the point of view of public education and public welfare. And he also said the wireless spoken word has one definite field, and that is for broadcast of certain predetermined material of public interest from central stations. I want to draw attention very quickly that he looked at the importance and the potential of radio in terms of public education and public welfare. I'll expand on that a little bit later. The next slide. Another two more quotations. The material must be limited to news, to education, and to entertainment. And Congress some few years ago authorized the Secretary of Commerce to impose certain conditions designed to prevent interference between the stations. This legislation was drawn before the development of wireless telephone. So he recognized that the, uh, the original act of 1910 was antiquated. It no longer served the purposes of then contemporary broadcasting in the 1920s. The next slide. One of the problems he noted is who to support the sending stations. In certain countries, he noted, the government has prohibited the use of receiving instruments except upon payment of a fee out of which are supported government sending stations. And he said he believed that that plan would not be a good one for the United States. And he was very much in favor of operation by the private sector, not government owned, radio stations, but private sector radio stations, much like private newspapers. Next slide. 
talk a little bit about the, uh, the regulation efforts. And if we'll move on to the, uh, the next slide, I think we can uh, see a couple of things. We won't stay on this one very often. What happened after the first radio conference was that there was proposed legislation that failed to pass Congress. And so what you see on the left is a news release announcing that a second radio conference will be held. And on the right is a letter to interested participants to attend the upcoming second radio conference. So we'll take a look at the second, at the next slide. The second radio conference, these I think are the key ingredients and the uh, results. Uh, there were proposals to reduce interference among stations and that was something that all of them agreed that they needed to do, including radio operators themselves. Frequencies reserved for both ship communication and radio stations. The uh, conference also agreed on the establishing of class A and class B stations. And this simply means class A were more powerful in terms of the amount of operating power they had, class B stations uh, were less powerful. And then specific radio allocations for amateur operators. Next slide. Very quickly, these were the original frequencies. Uh, they no longer are in effect, but I think if you quickly look, you can see the range of the frequency, the radio spectrum that was being used and suggested at the time. So we'll move on to the next slide. Today, what we end up having is that the radio spectrum actually ranges from three kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. The AM frequencies, as I think most of us know, are between 535 and 1605 kilohertz. FM frequencies between 88 and 108 megahertz. And then there are still separate allocations for all of the TV channels. And then uh, in between some of these allocations, uh, the Commerce Department has reserved space for different types of services. Don't worry about the numbers that you've seen. There will not be a quiz at the end of this. We'll move on to the next slide. The Radio Act also established the radio, the Federal Radio Commission, the FRC, and it was responsible for licensing radio stations, reducing interference. Uh, it also established an important concept and that is the public owns the radio spectrum, but stations are licensed to use it, stewards, if you will. The public owns the radio spectrum, but stations are licensed to use it. And then uh, this was very much in keeping with the spirit and the belief and the philosophy of Herbert Hoover that radio, this uh, new art, as he liked to refer to it, should operate in the public interest, convenience, or necessity. That remains a standard today. It's the so-called PICON principle, public interest, convenience, or necessity. Next slide. It also established equal time for political candidates. Again, that uh, continues today. It forbade obscene, indecent, or profane language. And again, that remains in effect today. It did not have the power to censor program content. And I think this is really a significant development. And it's one of the real differences between the American private sector operation of media, communication platforms of all forms and other governments where in fact the government is in charge of communication. And what that means very quickly is that if the government is unhappy with certain communicators, certain communication enterprises, it has the power to pull the lever and to end those. And that's happened in many autocratic countries and authoritarian regimes around the world. Uh, we decided early on in the United States, the government should stay out of content 
and the FRC could revoke the licenses if a station was not serving the public interest convenience or necessity. So if we'll uh, move on to the next one. The uh, Radio Act of 1927 was short-lived. It was succeeded by the 1934 Communications Act. So basically what we had with the Radio Act of 1927 was the establishment of a set of rules and regulations to give Congress and other interested stakeholders more time, if you will, to develop something that was a little bit broader and more concrete. It established the Federal Communications Commission, which is completely independent of uh, any uh, other government agency. It incorporated existing legislation by merging so-called common carriers and broadcasting. So it uh, brought in some other entities that were being regulated elsewhere and brought them into the Communication Act. Later regulation, other amendments to the Communications Act established regulation over television, satellite, and com cable communications, and then also over the telephone service and importantly for today, internet service providers, ISPs, and we're continuing to debate how that's going to uh, play out. Next slide. Telecommunications Act of 1996. This goal was simply to deregulate the communication industry. And by deregulate, we simply mean invite everyone to come in who was interested in communication and not limit it necessarily to the traditional folks that we kind of think of. So this was broadening the opportunity for many more people to get into the communication industry. So if we'll move to the next slide. There, no, comp, no a company TV stations could exceed 35% of the national audience. And this was tried to reduce the possibility of monopolies, mon, uh, monopolizing content of radio and television stations. Next slide. Uh, greater parental control of children's viewing. That was the famous or infamous, depending upon your point of view, V-chip, that all future radio uh, television stations were, re television sets, television sets were required to include to allow parents to have greater control over their children's ac to access to programming, programming that parents didn't want their children to view. Next slide. And rules against internet pornography and objectionable content. So again, what we're talking about is in the Telecommunications Act of 1996, it tried to broaden some of the regulation of the 1934 Communications Act. Next slide. And then a plans to expand internet access. That continues to be a topic of much discussion, especially when we're talking about broadband access and expansion to areas that aren't well served at the moment. Next slide. Today, let me uh, kind of summarize where we are at the moment because I want to, as I said, uh, have time for your questions. Currently, we have about 15,441 radio stations. Now, that's the broad number, radio stations. That also includes AM radio stations, FM radio stations, commercial stations, educational stations, non-commercial stations, but the round number is 15,441. In terms of television stations, 3,800, and again, uh, that includes a variety of VHF, UHF, low power community television stations, if you will. So the total number, uh, if you include all of the additional kinds of radio and television related stations, the total is 33,511. That seems like a sizable number in terms of serving the public interest or convenience convenience or necessity. Next slide. 
Some of the uh, issues that I think we uh, need to discuss and are before the FCC and policymakers are these that are listed here. A broadband expansion. How do we get information out to the public in terms of uh, expanding access to the broadband and uh, to uh, various areas of the United States? As we know some areas of the country are underserved. And so the FCC and policymakers in Congress are dealing with that. We're also talking about the uh, 5G services, the fifth generation of mobile communication devices, cell phones, if you will, and exactly uh, how we're going to free up spectrum space to accommodate those. And we'll need more spectrum space in order for this fifth generation of mobile devices to operate effectively. Network neutrality, who has access to the internet and the people who do have access, will there be equal access? Now, a lot of times that means, will the speed of certain kinds of content be at the same speed as content from some of the larger better known entities. So it's supposed to be equal across the board. It is not yet, and Congress is still debating this, and there's also legislative discussions at the state level as well. Ownership rules. What's interesting about the ownership rules is that the FCC has continued to define and refine the ownership rules. And so what has gone from about forbidding any company to have television stations that would reach more than 25% of the audience of the nation, uh, that's gone up to uh, 35%, and now it is almost at 39%. So that means that let's say a company like Hearst Television cannot have a total number of television stations whose coverage area exceeds more than 40% of the US audience. What's happened is that it has allowed conglomerations, these large media companies to get even larger. We can debate whether that's good or bad. A lot of people obviously think that is bad. They will argue that it means that those people who have the potential or want to get into the broadcasting field, like minority organizations, don't have a chance because they're being crowded out as larger entities buy up existing radio and television stations. Uh, social media content, this is one of the kinds of things that we're debating now. Who can say what? Let's talk about Twitter. Let's talk about Facebook. Let's talk about YouTube. Let's talk about Instagram. Let's talk about several of those kinds of social media. Who should be allowed to have access? Who should be allowed to say certain things? And so that's one of the issues that we're debating. And as I think uh, many of you know, several states have passed uh, laws saying that these large communication uh, companies within the borders of their respective states cannot censor content, cannot censor potential users. We'll see how that plays out. And then finally, news deserts. We have seen since about 2000, the loss of about 2000 newspapers in the United States. We also are seeing the decline of radio stations radio stations going off the air. And if we'll go to the next slide, I think we'll be able to see a couple of examples. On the far left, you see KMRV radio in Alamakee County, which is in the far northeast corner of Iowa. This month, it surrendered its license. It went off the air. Now, it did say in the letter, it, in the letter that it sent to the FCC, it acknowledged that it continues to provide some kind of information online and uh, through uh, its FM channels, but it has gone off the air. These are all AM stations that have surrendered their license. Uh, we have uh, La Jefa in the Quad Cities. We have uh, 
uh, family radio and uh, we have KOLT. And so what we're talking about in family radio would be in uh, Michigan and uh, KOLT is in Nebraska. So I think if we'll move to the next slide, what I wanna do is uh, stop at this particular point and uh, open up the opportunity for questions and uh, comments. And uh, I wanna take the necessary time so that we can actually have a good discussion. So uh, that's the formal part of the presentation. And now I look forward to your questions. So okay. thank you. Well, great. Well, uh, Steve, you excellent presentation. And, and uh, you know, the media is just changing rapidly. And we have several questions about history and also about present today. And uh, I'll go ahead and start off with the first one that's on top. It's uh, from an anonymous attendee. But the question is, can you explain the difference between radio regulations that prohibited censorship of content and social media platforms uh, that do not remove content they find objectable? objectable? Yes, I think the uh, principal difference is that uh, radio is considered to be, the stations are considered to be operating on public airwaves, and that is the airwaves belong to the public. They are not private entities. They, radio stations and, broad, and radio stations and television stations are stewards, if you will. They are basically licensed to operate in the public interest, convenience, or necessity. Now, they may be private entities, but they're, but they're not owners of the frequency. And so they have to abide by certain standards and recommendations, public service commitments, if you will. Now, the other companies that we're talking about, some of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, these are considered to be private entities. They're companies. And so they can make their own decisions. They are not operating in the public interest. They are private companies and they can make whatever decisions they want. Now, one could argue whether you think that's a good thing or not. And certainly some of the Republican controlled state legislators have said that is not a good idea. Uh, that's censoring content that's forbidding certain potential users and that's not a good idea that's wrong we'll see how that plays out but I, that's the basic difference i think you have social media platforms are considered to be private businesses they're able to do whatever they want as private businesses but radio stations and television stations are only licensing with the permit of the public to, on uh, radio and television airwaves. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Cliff's got a couple questions. First one is, is uh, how, did, how did you develop an interest in this subject? <laughs> That's an excellent question. I sometimes <laughs> ask myself why did I develop this interest. <laughs> I fell in love with radio in high school. Uh, I had a speech class and one of the assignments was we would go to the local radio station, KFJB at Marshalltown, my hometown, and uh, we would every week have a half hour radio show and I loved that. And at the same time, when I first walked into a radio studio and saw the control board, I thought I'd gone into some place like NASA or some kind of a space operation. I just loved the look of what then I considered to be a really sophisticated kind of equipment. And I thought, wow, uh, being able to talk on radio and operate this equipment, I think this would be a great fun. And so I've been in love with it uh, my entire life. Oh, great, great, great. Well, uh, Dennis asked a question. He goes, the elimination of the fairness doctrine resulted in the rise of conservative talk radio. Now contrasting opinions are not heard on radio stations. How healthy do you think this has been in terms of public and political discourse and understanding? I think uh, the elimination of the fairness doctrine was a mistake. And I think it was a mistake because it was a mandate that in fact did require contrasting points of view to be aired on radio stations. Now, one of the unfortunate things uh, 
on the part of many radio stations was simply that they did not understand what the Fairness Doctrine was supposed to do. Many radio stations looked at the Fairness Doctrine and thought, well, that's Uncle Sam, that's the government telling us what to do. All the Fairness Doctrine was saying was that journalism and radio and television stations should be doing what they were supposed to be doing in the first place, and that is operating the public interest, convenience, or necessity. So, for example, if you had someone who was very much in favor of a particular issue, let's just use uh, pro-life and pro-choice, for example. So if you had some kind of person commenting about pro-life, then fairness doctrine mandated that, well, you needed to give uh, pro-choice persons an equal opportunity to talk about that same issue. Radio stations, unfortunately, decided they didn't want to do that. So what they basically did was they just simply shied away from those kinds of issues. And one of the things they did not do was editorialize. Now, some television stations and some radio stations do editorialize, but, but very few. The fairness doctrine was simply that, give equal opportunities for contrasting points of view to discuss the merits of their particular uh, viewpoint. And that's what radio stations should be doing. And uh, so eliminating that was a bad idea. And I think uh, the quality of radio is lesser for it. And so what's happened is, as a direct result of that, we have had the growth of all talk radio stations, some of which are uh, liberal in orientation, some of which are conservative in orientation. And so we've basically drowned out the opposing viewpoints that people uh, might express if they had an opportunity to go on those respective radio stations. The elimination of the fairness doctrine was a bad idea. It was a mistake. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, 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 a listener asked, how successful was Hoover in using radio to convey his administration's goals? He was really quite uh, successful. And in fact, uh, he did use radio extensively to, uh, if you will, explain some of the policies that he had. He certainly used it during his 1928 presidential campaign. And one of the things that we explain in the documentary about Herbert Hoover and the Radio Act of 1927 is that he recognized that radio was an opportunity to bypass how the press might attend some of his news conferences or take some of the statements during some interviews, massage that content, and then reframe it and send it to the public in a form that uh, Herbert Hoover didn't think was accurate or really didn't like the way they had shaped the narrative, if you want to use that term. So he saw radio as being able to go directly to the public without anyone else massaging or uh, interpreting the content. So I think he was quite successful in doing that. Now, of course, the fireside chats of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt get much of the historical attention about someone who was able to use radio effectively. And he did, and he used these fireside chats to explain his policies uh, quite effectively. Hubert Humphrey, I mean, uh, Herbert Hoover did do that and uh, he certainly started that, but uh, Roosevelt certainly took it to a whole new level. Okay, we're good, thank you. Um, uh, another question is, some claim that radio has survived because of daily commuters tied up in traffic listening to the radio. Has the audience for radio remained stable or is it like print media on the decline? Uh, it certainly is on the decline in terms of certain types of uh, radio stations. I'm sorry, there's an incoming call and I just turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. The, uh, Radio listenership certainly is on the decline in some areas. And uh, the, uh, what we have seen as well as I pointed out in an earlier slide, some AM stations have gone off the air simply because 
there is no listenership and those stations couldn't find someone to come in and buy the uh, stations when they put themselves up for sale. So there has been some decline in AM uh, radio listenership. Now, some of those listeners have moved to online versions of those same radio stations, but you're absolutely right. With these new communication platforms, there are many more choices, many more communication options for all of us. We have many more ways of getting information, getting entertainment, uh, sharing views, if you will. And so uh, AM radio, except for some of the larger clear channel voices and some of the all news and all talk stations, uh, they continue to do reasonably well. But the other stations, some FM operations and AM Uh, stations are struggling with formats. What's going to appeal to potential listeners? And in fact, the stations that I put up on this slide went off the air uh, primarily because they changed their format several times, trying to appeal to an audience that isn't there anymore. Okay, very good. Um, Another question that we have, Steve, is, um, you know, all communication systems, radio, television, internet, begin with lofty goals of news, education, and entertainment, but seemingly end at vast wastelands. Can you explain why or have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, Newton Minow, who was a former uh, FCC commissioner, once uh, said that he looked at the landscape of television and all he saw was a vast wasteland. And what he was basically saying was that the uh, type and quality of programming wasn't really helping or serving the uh, public interest. And so I think what some people believe is that's what's happening with some radio stations. It's very difficult, I think, when uh, new communication platforms come along, sometimes even new products of other types come into the marketplace for traditional vendors of content or products and services to either adapt to the change to uh, see how they need to compete. And I think what's happened is many radio stations have failed to be able to change, failed to adapt, are no longer able to compete successfully because there are alternatives out there. And even though some of these radio stations have moved online, to try to capture some of the audiences, uh, they simply haven't been all that successful. Another problem that is really significant is the so-called migration of advertisers to many of these new platforms, to some of these social media outlets. And uh, let's be honest that the radio and television industry in the United States as private sector businesses are for-profit companies. They are trying to make money and they're trying to do that by connect advertising to listeners and viewers. Well, if you can no longer uh, explain to your viewers and listeners that the audience isn't there, then uh, you have to, then you're in trouble. So many of the advertisers have moved on to uh, online uh, platforms. Now, not as quickly as some people would have you believe, but that move is underway. Okay, very good. Uh, Gary asks, he says, the the deregulation of radio station ownership in the 80s, was it the right thing to do in 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 your mind? I understand the uh, theory behind uh, uh, deregulating ownership What's interesting is that uh, I was certainly in uh, the early part of my career when the uh, deregulation began. And for example, in uh, central Iowa, at one time you had KRNT radio, KRNT television, and the uh, letters RNT stood for the uh, Register and Tribune, the Des Moines Register and Tribune. And those three entities, the newspaper, the radio station, the television station, all belong to the same company. Well, deregulation was an attempt to say, wait a minute, this is potential monopolization. This is 
controlling the content. We have too many of these entities being controlled by the same company. That's not a good idea. We need uh, broader viewpoints. We need more voices in the market. So the FCC deregulated the industry and forced these uh, companies, not only in Des Moines, but in other communities to divest themselves of these radio and television stations. Now you fast forward to 2021 and what's happened. They're allowed to do that again. So we went from deregulation, which at that time the theory was we need more diversity. We don't have enough alternative sources of information. So we need to divest these companies and they need to sell off their properties and allow newcomers to enter the market. Well, now the FCC is saying in 2021, that's no longer the case. There are so many alternatives available that uh, we don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So um, question JD asked, he says, was there ever any concern about the health effects of radio waves transmitting through the air into human bodies, especially when radio first came out? Well, I'm not an expert on that, and I haven't <laughs> read enough of the history, but I have no doubt that someone somewhere probably had some concerns about that. To what degree that was uh, looked at seriously and what conclusions might have been reached, I don't know. But I don't have any doubt that there was some concern about that, yes. Okay, okay. So uh, Gary also asked another question. He says, do you know what the average price for a home radio was in Hoover's time? And did they get cheaper in similar fashion like the Model T with mass production and so forth like that? So, I mean, and, and I, uh, I visit my mother-in-law's house and there's still a big old radio there that they used out on the farm that- um, Well, that certainly it, some of the early radio receivers were really expensive and they were pieces of furniture. If you look at some of the yeah. pictures of old time radio sets, just beautiful additions to your living room or wherever you decided to have the radio receiver. Absolutely beautiful. I think what happened is what has always happened and that is the, uh, the more product that is uh, produced, uh, the cheaper and more affordable the uh, uh, devices become. I remember our first television set uh, it was, I was no more than uh, 10 years old. And I remember looking at the price tag of this black and white television set. It was $365 and 50 cents. And this had to have been, oh, let's see, I was 10 years old. So we would have been talking about 1952. I don't have an inflation calculator, but I think that was a really steep price for a television set. Uh, $365.50 in 1952. But uh, eventually, yes, the more receivers that were manufactured, radio and television, uh, the cheaper they got. But I don't think as dramatically as some uh, later electronic devices that we think about today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, does equal time for political candidates mean TV and radio have to cover each candidate for the same amount of time in their newscasts? We're talking about certain, uh, there are certain provisions that come into play. For example, if uh, there are four exceptions to equal time for political candidates, uh, one of which is you can cover a political candidate as part of a so-called bona fide newscast if this person is part of a story that's unrelated to a political campaign and you are not obligated to provide equal time. If you have a bona fide interview uh, program, uh, you are not obligated to provide equal time. If you have a bona fide documentary, you are not obligated to provide equal time. What stations in my opinion, should do is to make every effort to provide opportunities. One of the things that's really kind of strange about the equal time provision for political candidates is that 
In the past, we have seen these very, very strange incidents. Ronald Reagan comes to mind. Okay, Ronald Reagan was an actor. He was running for governor of California. One station had an old movie starring Ronald Reagan. Okay, that movie did not fall under any of the four prohibitions that would disallow a request for equal time. So despite the fact that it was simply a movie with Ronald Reagan, it wasn't exempt from uh, a request for equal time and challengers were successful in asking for equal time simply because <laughs> Ronald Reagan <laughs> appeared in this movie. Okay, I know that that seems ludicrous, but in fact, uh, that's what happened. I think that uh, there have been, there were some stations that I know uh, decades ago that th the way that they would handle the equal time provision is that they would specify a certain time. Let's say, for example, 12 noon on a Wednesday. And every political candidate for a particular office would be given 10 minutes to uh, speak about a particular issue. That's one way uh, some stations have handled it. Okay. Okay. So uh, Russell asks, he says, what are your thoughts on the mass ownership of radio stations, many in the same town? I understand that the uh, theory behind uh, that is uh, if you have too many stations in the same community being owned by basically one company, uh, is that monopolizing content? I think so. I think there's a potential for that. Uh, if you would uh, not permit that and allow more persons to come into that community, is that better? In my opinion, I think it is. I understand the arguments by the FCC. They say, well, all these new communication platforms and alternatives of information, we no longer need to do that. We no longer need to protect these communities because the uh, consumer has all these other alternative opportunities that didn't exist in the past. However, I think it does prevent the entry of certain groups, minorities primarily, from entering the market, getting radio stations or television stations, even low power that they might be able to afford. So uh, I just don't think that it's a good idea. Okay, okay. Well, very good. Well, uh, uh, Joan asks, aside from regulation, in your opinion, who have been some of the great radio and TV journalists and personalities of Iowa? Any assessment of their impacts? <laughs> Well, Iowa certainly has had some great uh, broadcast journalists, and I run the risk here of forgetting to name all of them once <laughs> I start. But I will say that, of course, Jack Shelley of WHO is a, was a legendary Iowa broadcaster, and I mention him because uh, he hired me to teach at Iowa <laughs> I was blessed to spend my first year teaching at Iowa State with Jack Shelley's last year teaching at Iowa State. And I must tell you that in the same classroom with Jack Shelley, even though I was supposed to be a co-instructor, I was definitely the minor partner. And I learned from every single class that Jack Shelley taught. Grant Price was a legendary broadcaster for WMT and KWWL over in Waterloo and uh, Cedar Rapids. Uh, we certainly had Dick Petrick, who was extraordinarily well known as a legendary radio broadcaster. Uh, Herb Klambeck for WHO, and there are several others. I apologize for not mentioning everyone, but Iowa has a really, really long a colorful and well-deserved history of excellent broadcast journalists. We've been blessed. Well, great, well, great. Well, we're at the seven o'clock hour, Steve, so I've got one final question for you. How can we watch Steve's documentary on the subject that you talk about? <laughs> well, it is uh, posted on YouTube, and uh, this might seem like a circuitous way of getting there, but uh, let me uh, tell you how to do it nevertheless.
If you go to my website, which is stephenkuhn.org, that's Stephen with a PH, stephenkuhn.org, on the left side of the homepage, there will be a menu. If you scroll down to where it says broadcast and video, click on that. Then you go down in alphabetical order to the bottom where it says YouTube. Open that. And all of the videos that I have uh, posted are on YouTube on that site. And if you go to Herbert Hoover Director's Cut, and it's 26 minutes long, if you go to Herbert Hoover Director's Cut, I think you will find it there. So again, stephenkuhn.org on the homepage, go to the menu on the left, broadcast in video, click that, go down to YouTube at the bottom, click that, and then I think in about the third or fourth row of the videos, you'll find Herbert Hoover Director's Cut. And thank you for asking for that. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, and what we'll try and do too is uh, I'll challenge Brad, who uh, our communications director that's working behind the scenes here tonight to uh, go find that and put it on a social media link and uh, and we'll post it uh, out on our Facebook and also on our Twitter accounts too, if you don't mind. So on that. So again, that's all the time we have for questions. Now, a lot of great questions. And I know we had some unanswered, which is why we always ask for you to vote for the most popular ones on that. So um, I'd like to thank Steve Kuhn for joining us tonight and for an excellent presentation. Thank you. I'd also, I'd also like to thank the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum and the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site and of course, all of the public libraries that help make tonight's program a success. And I'd encourage you all to come visit the Hoover campus and enjoy a walk around the park and explore the historic buildings as all the construction equipment is now gone and the park is just looking fantastic. Now for now, the Presidential Library remains closed to the public, but I think the time is getting close for reopening of the museum. So watch our social media posts uh, for that. As soon as we get word on that, we will be posting on that because I know many of you are anxious to get back in there. Uh, it's been a long time uh, coming and uh, it'll be great to do that. The National Historic Site is also welcoming back visitors for the 2021 summer season with historic buildings and the visitor center now open. Be sure to stop by on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday to see the new blacksmiths in action at the Jesse Hoover Blacksmith Shop. The forge is hot, and they are busy hammering away from 11 to 3 on those days. And it's a great interactive, especially to bring kids to. The Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is also ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus. And of course, don't forget to tune in next month for another great third Thursday program. On behalf of all of us here at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight and look forward to your next visit to the Hoover campus. Have a great evening. Good night.